Uh, I'm Dr. Andrew Heyman, and uh, I guess I have to introduce myself. I'm on faculty at the University of Michigan in the Department of Family Medicine. My clinical responsibilities there include uh, seeing patients, uh, conducting uh, outcomes research, as well as teaching residents and medical students. I also own a, a private practice in uh, Virginia as well. And the areas of research interest for me include uh, abnormal stress response as well as managing uh, cardiometabolic uh, disease. And you'll notice that for um, you know, some of the slides, uh, there's a little bit of overlap between myself and Dr. Edwards because, uh, in fact, she and I write on the topic of abnormal stress response together. And we're trying to kind of reinforce understanding in terms of what this entity is and how to manage it. My job today is to hopefully expand your knowledge base in terms of how to think about low cortisol and what else is going on with your patients beyond just sort of that knee-jerk reaction of it's low, raise it. And if you notice with Dr. Edwards, in fact, a lot of the problems that occur with patients that end up with low cortisol have nothing to do necessarily with the HPA axis itself. Most of the areas that become damaged under prolonged states of chronic stress actually have to do with either the central nervous system in the brain or with the immune system. So in fact, when you're thinking about patients that when you, when you test them with sal sal uh, salivary cortisol and you see their four-point level is low, you want to think about these other areas. And, when you, and, and in particular, if you notice the adaptogenic herbs, they all work centrally. They're not working peripherally. And so I think that's a potent indicator of, you know, how else should we be uh, evaluating our patients and, and in what other ways should we be, be protecting them when you see a low cortisol pattern. So today, um, I would like to review a little bit about the physiologic stress response and evaluate impact of cortisol on the nervous system and the immune system, examine common illnesses in the context of hypocortisol states that mediate disease progression and prognosis, and review treatment strategies and, and a, cl a clinical case. So here's one of my all-time favorite researchers uh, who, for a number of years, has specifically looked at the central nervous system and its evaluation in the context of many, many different diseases. And his name is Fu Fuad Lachine. Um, he writes, a human being is much more than the sum of blood, bone, and viscera. In the same way, each fragment of truth in itself is a lie. Therefore, the accumulation of unintegrated scientific facts do not protect us against ignorance. In the measure that we interrelate a greater number of fragments, the closer we can come to truth, although truth as an absolute is unattainable. And what I think he's saying is you have to look at the connections. You have to look at the relationships in physiology and how whole systems are shifting in one direction or another and not just get stuck on one component. Because if you see something that's low and you fall into the trap of, I have to raise it, without looking at the central drivers of that, you might be really missing the boat with your patients. And I think some of us are probably doing this long enough where when you have a patient and you think, oh, it's low cortisol, I just have to raise it and give it an adaptogen, and you're missing the chronic infection, or you're missing hippocampal atrophy, or you're missing cytokine activation and decreased vagal tone in the autonomic nervous system, you're not going to fix that patient. So what I want to do is go through some of what that really looks like. So integrative physiology, examining multiple organ systems simultaneously, seeking primary, primary causative factors driving complex biochemical abnormalities, utilize treatment strategies aimed at restoring allostasis and balance in the body and reducing allostatic load, emphasize treatments that improve physiologic function while avoiding risk or harm, and it's really kind of this ecological model of medicine. So today, I want to talk about one of my triads, at least to some degree. And this is how I break the body down into functional relationships. If you look at the emerging literature on the uh, connection, the permanent crosstalk that occurs between the digestive tract, our immune system, and our central nervous system, it really is astounding. And some people are beginning to argue, in fact, it's one system that has various aspects of its expression. So for today, I'm just going to talk about the brain and the immune system in the context of stress. But for me, gut immune brain is really important because it's primary command and control. It's about filtering, defense, and repair. It's our major physiologic interfaces where there, there is all of this communication going on between digestion, immune system, and central nervous system function. And when it's normal, physiologically speaking, as well as psychologically, we are organized and secure. 
we're organized and secure mentally and emotionally, as well as we're organized and secure in the way that we deal with the outside world and the way our immune system and our digestive tracts deal with the outside and inside world as well. And when it's imbalanced, we see disorder and unpredictability. The emergence of cognitive disorders, bipolar disease, as well as the development of autoimmune disease and even cancer, an immune system that's gone out of control. It's not secure. It doesn't understand self from not self. So in my mind, you know, what's so central about this, it's about a person, or physiologically speaking, as well as psychologically, the ability to absorb and let go. It's cell-level intelligence. It's self-knowing, self from non-self psychologically as well as physiologically. It's about calm borders between the digestive tract and a, that immune system that's sitting right there. And then all of those nerve cells that are penetrating deep into the digestive tract that are in constant communication with each other. And people will feel grounded and centered when it's in balance. So command and control, defense and repair, absorption and elimination. But what happens when you throw stress into this mix? What happens to our brain? What happens to our immune system? So here's a nice model. I really like this because it begins to articulate the relationship between cortisol production and stress and how it affects our afferent nerves that are coming out of the central nervous system that penetrate down into the digestive tract and how that eventually leads to excess inflammation, gut permeability, and the feedback that goes on to the hypothalamus. That in fact, we see these relationships emerging in terms of what stress does to the brain and what stress does to the gut and the immune system. So stress. There are many, many definitions of stress. I like the McEwen definition. He's a current researcher. He's out of the Rockefeller Institute and he talks about allostasis. This was defined in the late 1990s. The ability to achieve stability through change is critical to survival. Our stress system protect the body by responding to internal and external stress. And that relates to the autonomic nervous system, the HPA axis, cardiovascular and metabolic systems, as well as the immune system. Allostatic load is the price of accommodation to stress, really the wear and tear that results from chronic overactivity or underactivity of allostatic systems. And so each individual's stress response is mediated by their genetics, by their personal history, as well as their current environment. And you can basically look at this as sort of an open system in terms of anyone's in a particular response to stress and how, it, how the person modulates or buffers or breaks down under stress. And the question is, what breaks down first? Is it the brain? Is it the immune system? Is it receptors uh, in the HPA axis? So McEwen talks about normal and abnormal stress response. And these are just basically patterns of abnormality. So the first one, the blue one that goes up and down, that's normal. You have a stress, cortisol goes up, and then it declines. Then over time, we have what's, what's called lack of adaptation, meaning that we don't mount a stress response the way we should, that there's all these down regulatory mechanisms that occur to protect the organism against ongoing stress. 